Ta ahas and don arum an kainter shah a haranul de dev anat be Linda Irvine a kanch fuin aber yan and she le taras one she a taras agus nish si and banister le taras. So without further ado, I will hand you over to uh, Linda Irvine, who is an Irish language advocate and also very well known as the founder and now manager of Taras. So Linda. No, no, my heart. Girl, my good feel now. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. So, I'm going to talk to you about the work that I do in East Belfast, and I, I call this talk the Maricolos Taurus. Taurus is the organisation that I run in East Belfast, and the reason I call this the Maricolos Taurus is because somebody once said that if there was ever an Irish language centre on the Newton Arch Road, that'd be a bloody miracle. So there you go; they do happen. And, um, and I'm going to tell you about our own little miracle. So these are all photographs taken around East Belfast Mission, the Skelos Centre, where I'm based on the Newton Arch Road. And I suppose when you look at some of the images, it doesn't really look like the sort of a place that would be very welcoming to Irish language or Irish culture. Unfortunately, we're a segregated community. This is Bryson Street and Bryson Street runs um, down. It's what it's, it's the, the peace line, I suppose, between what is the Protestant Newton Arch Road and the Catholic Short Strand. And I was actually born, I'm, I'm the third generation of my family that was born in the next street to this in Thistle Street. 20 odd years after the Good Friday Agreement, and we know in interface areas that people still haven't learned to live in peace with each other and that's, that's very, very unfortunate. And you get a lot of sort of low levels attacks where people throw golf balls and break windows and all sorts of things. And that's the bad news, but the good news is Taurus. So how did Taurus happen? So, well, it was almost 10 years ago now, it was actually just over 10 years ago that the, the first initiative happened and it was, a little linked project between Andreyhead. Andreyhead is a, an Irish language centre at the bottom of the Armour Road and East Belfast Mission on the Newton Arch Road. East Belfast Mission is a Methodist church and there's been a Methodist church on the Newton Arch Road for almost 200 years. So I was part of a, a cross community women's group that met in East Belfast Mission. Well, one week we met in East Belfast Mission and the next week we met in the Short Strand and we went back and forward. And as a women's group, we did all sorts of really exciting things. But one of the things that we did was we did a six week taster of the Irish language. I think what was most interesting about it was we, the, the Protestant women, we were kind of got quite intrigued with it. And the Catholic women, our friends from the Short Strand, they weren't interested at all. In fact, they were much more interested in the royal wedding that was coming up and what Kate's dress was going to look like. So there you go. I was the one who took on the most, I suppose. And the woman who was teaching the class, who is a Protestant from East Belfast, a fluent Irish speaker, she told me that there was going to be a Jane Cursor in Andreyhead. So I went along with my friend. And I just I just fell in love with the language, Hitchman and Raleigh and Changa. And I started then going to classes. I did it progressed from there. Well, a few months in, a local journalist got the hold of the story and I did an interview and it ended up in a couple of newspapers. I mentioned a Belfast mission in the interview. They were then approached by people who worked for them and people who lived locally who said, here, we want to be part of this class. We want to, to do this. Well, there was no class. It had been a six week taster six months before. But the mission approached me and said, look, if we got a teacher, would you be interested in facilitating that? And I said, yes. So as a volunteer, that's what I did. It seemed to me a great opportunity. I was learning Irish over in Andreyhead. And here I was able to do it on another night around the corner. Now, as well as starting to learn, the language. I started to learn about the language. And when I look back on it now, it does seem very strange that, you know, I didn't even know that Belfast 
was Belfast. Yeah. I had no idea about place names, surnames, words that we use in our everyday speech. I didn't know anything. And it was a real shock to me to find these things out. I wanted to share that information with other people because I had discovered this, this thing that I loved. And also one of the awful things that happened was I was shown on social media. I didn't even do social media at this time. Somebody showed me on Facebook where people were discussing me and condemning me for learning Irish. I remember showing my husband and he says, oh, Glenda, toughen up. Don't be taking it personally. This is what it is. Personal. They're talking about me. But he said, get a grip on yourself. And he was probably right. But these are the things that sort of motivated me that wanted to wanted to spread the word. And I got the opportunity. I approached Forest and Gillica, who are a cross-border Irish language um, funder, and I asked them would they would they fund a project for a year in East Belfast Mission. So I left my job and I came to work as an Irish language development officer. This is the, the mission um, on the Newton Arch Road. This is the, the big skin us building. So the night before I started the job, I started the job on the 3rd of September 2012. And we've been running a class, and you know, a voluntary class for about nine, about, no, about six months before that. And we were going to start another class because I was going to start the job. So night before I started the job, I was in a church, not East Belfast Mission, another local church. And I asked the pastor, would it be OK if I went up and made an announcement about this new class, this new beginners class? And he said, certainly, go ahead. And I went to the front of the group and I said, look, if anybody's interested in learning Irish, you know, we're going to have this total beginners class starting on Tuesday night and you'll be very welcome to come along. And I looked out onto a sea of very hard faces. And I said, you know, speak to me afterwards. And nobody spoke to me afterwards. In fact, some people never spoke to me again. And I remember going home that night feeling very deflated. And my husband said, Linda, you need to shut your mouth or we're not going to have any windows because we lived behind the mission. But the next morning I got up for work and I, I have a faith. And this was it on the September the 3rd, 2012. This was the daily reading and it says at the top why we work. And at the bottom it said, be not always wanting some other work to do, but gratefully perform the task the Lord has given you. Because no matter who pays your paycheck, you're really working for God. And I respect that a lot of people don't have a faith. I, I grew up without a faith. But for me, especially during the difficult times over the last lot of years, faith has been very, very important to me. And I believe that this is why I've been successful. I believe, you know, we have sold on what some people would regard as stony ground. And yet, you know, we, we have borne fruit. We decided to call ourselves Taurus. And of course, Taurus means journey. And for us, it turned out not just to be a journey in their language, but it turned out to be a journey of healing and a journey of reconciliation. And I never set out to be a cross community project, but it's just a natural byproduct product of what I do. The majority of my learners come from East Belfast. The majority of my learners are from the PUL community. But of course, we attract people from the niceness community as well. So real friendships and relationships have formed and blossomed. And we don't have to do 10 Catholics, 10 Protestants. Let's sit down and talk about how different we are from each other. So what do we do? Well, we run lots of classes and I'll talk about them in a minute, but as well as our Irish language classes, we diverged into tourism. We, I suppose I, I got, I got to know that there was so much Gaelic history all around me in East Belfast. But I didn't have the ability or the time to be actually to research that properly. And I was going more and more frustrated about it. When in walked Gordon McCoy, Dr. Gordon McCoy, who came to work for me. And he had done all this research and it was amazing. Now, Gordon's an academic, so he likes to do a good old lecture. I'm a much more simple soul, so I like to ground things. So I turned it into a bus tour. 
And that was our first, first bus tour, the Gaelic bus tour of East Belfast, where we take people all around East Belfast, pointing out all aspects of Gaelic history throughout various years. Out of that then grew the Con O'Neill storytelling bus tour, which my husband does. And it tells the story of the last Gaelic Lord of our area. And it's not your typical bus tour because you get off the bus at certain places and then Con O'Neill's story is unveiled to you. I had to stop them because of the pandemic, but you'll be glad to know that they're starting up again. We hope to get them going in March. So, of course, we run classes. We're one of the biggest providers of classes now in Belfast. We sign up probably about 300 people a year. We have a group of Kyol, which started because we wanted to learn a few songs and that just became really successful. We're not fantastic singers, but we enjoy singing together and learning Irish language songs. We've sang on RTE a few times. We sang at the FLA for President Higgins. We've sang in a number of local churches in East Belfast. It's just good to be together. I'm always looking at ways to engage people within my own community um, with the language. And, you know, some of them will come along to classes, some of them will come to lectures, some of them will do the bus tours. But I wanted something else to get them. So I wrote a little comedy sketch based very much on my own experience. And it's about a man called Jimmy, and Jimmy's a, a real hardened loyalist. And um, his wife, Maggie, starts learning Irish. And Jimmy's very unreasonable, and he doesn't like the fact that Maggie's learning Irish. Now, I based this person on my husband, as I say, who's also very unreasonable about everything except the Irish language. Perfectly fine about the Irish language, but a real nuisance about everything else. So Jimmy gets really excited that Maggie's learning Irish and he says, you know, I don't want to hear a word of Irish in this house. And she says, fuck him. And she, he says, well, there's no need for bad language, Mary, Maggie. And she says, no, fuck all is the word for word in Irish. Well, I don't want to hear fuck all in here. I'll not be speaking any language Jerry Adams speaks, he says. And she says, well, I think he speaks English most of the time, doesn't he? Now, what's interesting about the story is, of course, Jimmy has to make his own journey with the language. And he discovers in the senses that members of his family spoke Irish. And I suppose that's what I've seen in my work. I see people on a journey and I've seen people, I've engaged with them who hate the language, and some of them who hate me. And then they've ended up becoming friends. They've ended up becoming volunteers. They've ended up becoming learners. So I suppose one of the things I've learned on my journey is not to be a barrier to people who are learning the language, who might someday want to learn the language. And I need to keep the door open for them. Sometimes that's not easy, but it's something I have to do. We've won all sorts of awards over the years and we started off very controversial and um, now we're, we're very mainstream and I'm very proud of the work we've done and the work we've achieved, as I know East Belfast Mission are. I remember when I started in East Belfast Mission, I was only in the job a few weeks and at first I, I shared a, an office with about six other people who were the youth worker and somebody working with the, the old people and, you know, all sorts of things. And I don't think they quite knew what to do with me. And I had to sit when my colleagues took phone calls. East Belfast Mission is a, a charity. And these people were ringing in and saying, I'm a patron of the mission, you know, I pay money into the mission. And I just want to let you know that now that you are doing the Irish language, I will be paying no more money into it. And I'm stopping my direct debit or whatever. I really thought that sacked me, but they didn't. They stood by me. So I'm very pleased about that. We have always had a lot of publicity. And I remember the first publicity we got, I said, you know, my goodness, we'll be a you know, a one day sensation and then they'll all move on. But that isn't what's happened over the years. We just continue to get a lot of publicity and we've had journalists from all over the world. We end up, I think we were in a, a Spanish newspaper there the other day, somebody sent it to me. So it's been, it's been really good. And we've always got very positive 
um, coverage. I love this one Ulster says ta, good Ulster saying something different. But not everybody likes us. And I remember this was one of the, the sort of big news stories that came out back, I think it was 2013 or 2014. And we hadn't been going that long. And a lot of our learners at that time were, were very nervous about learning the language. They didn't want friends to find out they were learning Irish or neighbours, sometimes even family members. They were frightened of intimidation. They were, were frightened of criticism. So I got a phone call one Saturday night and um, a journalist said to me, have you heard what happened at the protest, the loyalist protest? And I said, no, what was it? And they said, well, a member of the Orange Order came out and said that Protestants shouldn't be learning Irish and they shouldn't be taking funding for it. So obviously we were the only group at that time within the loyalist community who were funded to teach Irish and it was us who was being criticised. I didn't know what to do about it. I did some interviews on the Sunday and I went into work on Monday and it was all over the papers. It was on the TV. I worried about my learners because I thought they might scurry off home and not come back and then that would have been the death knell for tourists because we don't exist without them. But the opposite happened. They turned up en masse and actually some of them that we hadn't maybe seen in a few weeks contacted us, came and said, you know, we're not going to be told, we're not going to be intimidated, this is important to us and this is what we want to do. I got letters that week, I got emails, I got cards from people all over the world pledging their support, which was, was really lovely. And I've always found that with Taurus, for every bad thing that happens, a hundred good things happen. What was interesting was I had about three men who come in all separately and they said things that were strangers. I didn't know them, but they said things like, Linda, I'm a Protestant or I'm a Unionist. One of them even said I'm a member of the Orange Order. The Orange Order says that I shouldn't be learning Irish. What times your classes start up? So people are a bit like that. They're a bit thrown. They won't be told. And this is what my learners did in reaction to it. They started up their own organisation called Carja Taurus, Friends of Taurus. This is their, their logo. And they work very hard to help me and to support the work. They do all the, the teas and the dishes and run our, our lower land, we have a, all sorts of things they do. They organise talks and they, they, they go and meet people and they welcome people in. And I'm really, really glad of them. So here we are, we're very diverse. We're all ages, all backgrounds and all friends. We are a community. We started up a scholarship scheme um, a few years ago, and that actually should, haven't updated that. That should be nine. We now have nine of our learners at university, both Ulster University and Queen's University, doing diplomas and doing degrees. One of our learners is also, he never got involved in education. He came to us to learn Irish and then decided he would go and do a degree in history and politics. And he's now doing a PhD in history and politics. And he says it's because he got back in to study with Taurus. We have a lower land and we have over 3,000 resources. Sorry, it's over 4,000 resources of books, um, CDs, DVDs, games, all sorts of things, study areas. And we have a, a very, very active group of volunteers who run the lower land and keep it open for our learners. I think the wonderful thing about it, though, is it's not just for our learners. It's an actually a public lending library. We have a proper library lending system and it's open to the public for anybody who wants to, to borrow books. We have our own shop in there as well, a shop and we have an online shop too, where we, we sell all sorts of merchandise that we create ourselves and that brings in money into the into the, the project. We just there a few weeks ago 
launched a, a new book, a Colin Neal children's book, and it's in English, but it introduces little words of Irish, and it introduces the story of Colin O'Neill, the last Gaelic Lord of our area. We walk in the St. Patrick's Day Parade. We're looking forward to it this year. We haven't been for a couple of years with the pandemic. And I suppose this is the biggest bit of work that we've take, taken on, and this is Nice Skull on the Shoulder. So we started our own Nice Skull, Nice Skull of the Seals. And it came about because we became interested in the benefits of bilingualism and immersive education. But there are no Irish medium schools in East Belfast. The nearest one to us is Skull and Drayhage, which is in the south of Belfast. We decided we would start our own nursery. It has been very tough. We had no venue. We had applied for funding. And then I had an invitation from Branwell Primary School. Branwell is a big loyalist state in East Belfast. And they invited me in to teach Irish to the children. And I taught Irish for about three months to every single class. They made me aware that there was an old mobile at the back of the school that had been rented out privately for early years. So we were able to apply to the school board of governors and to the education authority who own it to use it for the nice school. And it was agreed that we could have 16 three-year-olds in there. Now there didn't seem to be any issue with us teaching Irish to all the children in the school. So we didn't for one minute visualize there was going to be any issue about us going in temporarily to an old mobile at the back of the school, but there was. So as soon as the word got out that this was going to be happening, the intimidation started. There was an online poll. There was all sorts of messages put up on social media, all sorts of threats made. There was a petition put in the local shop. They threatened to go out the doors. They threatened to have protests outside the school. They put up posters. They um, superimposed my face onto a Sinn Féin poster and claimed that this was a, a statement that I had made and they were posted up around the area that I live and it involved the police at that time. We didn't know who was involved, we didn't know why our paramilitaries were involved, we didn't know what sort of numbers were involved. It got very, very worrying. During this I got the MBE, which was Quite a nice thing to happen in the middle of what was a, a very, very difficult time. We decided to pull out of Branyal. Um, Branyal School were very keen that we would stay, but we felt that, you know, organised protests outside the school, which would disrupt the children there, was not the way to go. And we'd have lost a lot of sympathy. So we spoke to another provider, another venue provider in East Belfast and they decided they said that yes we could go there. They were a bit nervous about it but they said it was okay. Unfortunately we didn't make it public we were trying to play it down because you know we didn't want our parents getting scared we didn't want to lose staff or we were trying to employ staff at that time because we didn't want to vilify the Brandyal estate we didn't want to vilify the parents in the Brandyal school because we were getting loads of messages of support from them and the reality was the people who were causing the problem most of them were from outside the brand new, and a lot of them weren't even from East Belfast. Unfortunately it was made public this was a, a protest that was organised in the brand new state. Um, it was made public and it ended up in the in the newspapers that we were going to relocate after a hate campaign that caused the other provider to pull out. They were frightened. So in August, late August, instead of being ready to open at the beginning of September, we had the funding, we had the staff, we had the children, we had no venue. And we didn't seem to have any hope of getting a venue. We knocked on many, many doors in East Belfast. Some we weren't welcome, some we were welcome, but they couldn't provide a space for us. We needed five mornings a week. We needed a lot of things that social services insist that you have to have, you know, when you're providing a place for three-year-olds. We started to lose our parents. Our numbers started to go down and we nearly didn't survive. And then we were given another chance. 
I found it very difficult at the time. Why? To try and understand why somebody, why some people would be so against three-year-olds being immersed in another language, having the benefits of bilingualism. All sorts of rumours were spread about what we were doing and what our true intentions were. But when I thought about it, when you look at what's on the media all the time, when you look at the language that's used about the Irish language and about the people who support the language, about Irish language legislation, it's not really surprising that some people within the unionist community believe that they're saving Ulster by attacking the language, because this is the nonsense that's out there. So, you know, the people who try to do us a lot of harm, yeah, it was difficult. But I think the real blame comes from above, and I think the real blame comes from leadership. The story ends on a happy note because we were offered a new home in a local church and that's where we are now. We're in CFC on the Belmont Road. It's not ideal, it's a shared space. Everything has to be pulled out every morning from a very small cupboard and put back in. And um, you know, we have a lot of stuff. We are full. We have too many numbers for next year. We need to grow, we need to develop. We won't be able to do it where we are. We want our own venue. We want more staff. We want to. We want to be a bun scum, and it'll come. It will come, and we're fighting our way to do that. We have a, a lot of barriers against us, but what we do have is we have the support of parents. We do have some community support, so it's coming. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Maybe not. Can you see that? No. No. Fantastic. Gormila Mogat. Uh, Linda. So does anybody have any questions for Linda? Everybody's very shy tonight. Uh, yes, Stephen. So you're currently on mute. So you can just. Oh, sorry. There we go. Bore. Oh yeah, Stephen. Um, thanks very much, Linda, for a very interesting talk. Um, you've obviously uh, ridden a few bumpy, bumpy roads uh, to to get where you are. Do you have a lot of um, support from community leaders now in East Belfast, or do you still feel as if you're very much out on a limb, and the community leaders would really rather that you were and uh, not um, there? Yeah, I have some support from community leaders and um, some from within unionism and some within um, alliance, which is good. And, you know, that's sort of political and some some community leaders as well. I've also people who um, I think there's, there's I think there's a, a combination of things. There are people who have spoken out on my support from the from the word go from very early on. I think over the years, as we have become more successful, I think more people have felt able to speak out on our support, which is great. Um, I have people who don't like what I do, and there's other people who quietly will tell me they, you know, they support me, but are too frightened to speak out. So that's been a combination. I'm glad you know the people who feel frightened are less at the beginning. I think there was a lot of people who felt what I was doing was a good thing, but you know, didn't want to put their heads above the parapet. And I suppose that that's a sort of a normal thing. Um, but over the years, as I say, we're going now almost 10 years and, you know, it's changed. I definitely see the landscape changing. I see more and more people who feel able to, to speak out. I see more and more people who, you know, can see the nonsense of, you know, why would you think a language belongs to one community? Why would you? think that somebody's politics is a certain way because they speak Irish or are interested in Irish or want to learn Irish. And I very strongly feel that the more people from the PUL community who do learn, who do engage, it just changes attitudes. And I see it in my old learners, you know, our, our beginners classes are very big. And again, the majority of people are from the PUL community. 
and they have went from being frightened and you know if cameras come in they didn't want to be seen you know they left the room and all sorts of things they didn't want to give out interviews to now being as pleased as punch and telling their neighbours and Linda brought my friend down and my friend's going to join the next class and you know I've got my sister here too you know it's it's great to see so you know it's taken time and I see it very much in the bun school or in the knee school now as well you know, the majority of our, our parents are, are mixed marriages and every child then there's grannies and there's grandas and there's aunts and there's uncles and cousins. And, you know, and some of them are a wee bit taken aback that we jimmies, you know, got an Irish medium knee skull, but they love the child and they're embracing the idea now and they're not, it's normalising it. And now, you know, we're part of the network of nursery schools in East Belfast, you know, we're there, we're at the meetings. It's just... This is what you do now. Do you like it? Can you like it? Any other questions then for Linda? Uh, <clears throat> Linda, I have just one question. First of all, uh, congratulations on everything you do. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Um, I first heard about you when I read Susan McKay's um, book recently and uh, you know, I think your work is absolutely tremendous. Could I just working on a bit from, I think it was Stephen's question, he, about community support. What about political support? Have you had much um, in the lines of political support for what you're doing? Well, as mentioned, you know, we've had a, we've had a, a little bit, not not an awful lot. Um, we we need more, and um, you know, it's it's it has been hard at times over the years because. Especially in the, the, the early years, we, we were very much rowing our own boat. And, you know, somebody bought me a wee thing, you know, it said swimming against the tide. And it did feel very much like that. And some days it still does. When you take risks, you know, people don't always want to get behind you. But I have to say now the Alliance Party have always been very outspoken in our favour. And um, John Kyle, from who, well, he's not PUP anymore but John was always very supportive and um, Doug Beatty now has you know been to see me and I, I think the Ulster Unionist Party I'm, I'm glad to see that I think they're embracing the language more so yeah we, we keep keep pushing ahead I've had members of the DUP who have come to my classes though you know the DUP haven't been um, very vocal in their, their support of either me or the language. But I always, as I say, you know, I'm looking forward to things changing and I want to keep the door open. I did have a lovely conversation with Jeffrey there um, before he was leader and he said he's going to come and see me. And, uh, you know, I, I look forward to that happening. So, yeah, you know, no matter what happens, I have to keep smiling, keep putting out the hand of welcome. Because I do believe, I do believe there will be change and I believe it will come. And I believe that the things, you know, that have, have been done in the past and said in the past and attitudes, that they can be changed. And and the people that will still be negative will be, you know, the, 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 the wake, they'll, they'll be pulled along in the wake of the, the positivity. And I see the growth within the Irish language sector, you know, people go on the Irish medium schools, people learning the language, people engaging with the language, people supporting the language and just the love of the language. And I think that is the most positive thing whatsoever, but you can't ignore it. It's it's all around us and the beauty of it, you know. So, yeah, I just keep keep chipping away. Thank you. Um, I'll come in at that stage then, Linda, and ask my own question. You're, while you're chipping away, what's the next thing you're going to chip away at? Uh, you've achieved so, so much already, but what's, what have you got your eye on next? Well, it's definitely, there's there's two big things that we, we want to do. So we want to get our tourism project back up and running because, you know, it's a way for us to bring in money that helps to, to fund the project and do the important work. So we're just about to get delivery of a minibus. We never had our own minibus before. We used to have to borrow one. And we're going to get the, the tours up and running. So if any of you are interested in doing the Gaelic East Belfast tour or the Con O'Neill storytelling tour, we would we would love to accommodate that. And um, we have, we're also working, we work with Queen's University. The field where Con O'Neill's castle once stood 
We would like to get a scan done up there to look for the foundations. We would like to get um, actually, um, you know, pathways put in, so to create a whole set of Connell trails. So that's that's a that's a big wish list. And then, of course, the new school. We want our own place. That's so so important to us. We want to to grow. We want to have two sessions, and then we want to start a bun school. We want rang a tree. We want rang a hay and rang a door, rang a tree. We want to do that, and we want that in East Belfast. We want that opportunity for children in East Belfast to be able to attend Irish medium. And I think the important thing that I didn't mention about our Irish medium, um, the school is we are integrated. So. Irish medium is open to everybody, and I get that. But integrated actually goes a step forward. It doesn't say look, the doors open, anybody can come in. It actually says we will have 40, 40, 20, 40 Protestant, 40 Catholic, and 20% of others. So they're more proactive, and we wanted to have that. So ours has brought both sectors together nicely the integrated sector and the Irish medium sector. It's the first time they've successfully worked on a, a shared project that has actually came to fruition. So we want that to happen and we want to have an integrated Irish medium school in East Belfast. It is going to be really hard work. It's going to be really, really tough, but it's going to happen. Oh, we wish you all the best of luck with that as well, Linda, and no doubt it actually it will happen and I hope it does soon. PJ, you were looking to come in there with a question. You're on mute. And um, so if you hold down your space bar while you're speaking, it should uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, uh well it's just to uh, uh Linda. Uh tell me this uh, are you involved in anything else outside of the Irish language related outside of the Skinner Centre. Are in, we involved in, in, in East Belfast? Sorry, can you repeat your question? <laughs> sorry, sorry for, for not being clear. Uh, no, no, you're outside of outside of the Skinner Centre. Uh, obviously, the work you're doing in the Skinner Centre that's absolutely fantastic. But is there anything else happening uh, in East Belfast, which is which in one way or another involves the Irish Language Act or Irish language simply? Um, not a lot. Um, yeah. I'm involved, I'm the president of East Belfast GAA, and um, and there's 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 some uh, you know, obviously with the, the GAA there's involvement with the Irish language. Um, but there's there's not a lot else in East Belfast, no, unfortunately. And um there you go. We obviously we we engage with other groups within East Belfast and you know do talks and all sorts of things, but we are the only people providing it. Even within the unionist community, I suppose we're one of the very few. Um, you know, over the years we have tried to help other groups to start up, but it's been very very difficult. Um, one group we we helped in Lisburn and we provided a teacher, but they they didn't get the chance to grow. They, they, the venue that they used were scared, didn't want them advertising, and eventually they just dwindled away. We helped another group in Balamoni, they were threatened, and so they stopped. Um, we've helped a, a few other groups. So there is one still going down in Larn. They've moved now to Bally Galley and it's still going. I'll actually even going down to visit them. It's a cross community group. So there's there's not a lot, and I think I, I feel quite frustrated about that. But I can't clone myself. You know, I'm I'm local to East Belfast. I'm not local to the other areas. I can't go in the other areas and sort out the problems there. You know, and also what I know with what's happened with Taurus is, you know, sometimes you just have to face up to things. You know, we've been threatened. You know, we've been told we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. We just keep doing it. We just keep doing it, and that's it. And there you go. And that's what you just have to do. You just have to brazen it out. But unfortunately, not everybody feels able to do that, and I I understand that, I get that, but you know I just don't think we have had any choice. You know. Good, Linda. I think another thing that I, I'd like to add is one of the things that's given us the strength is when we started. One of the things I didn't want to do, and there was a few people, not people involved in tours, but people kind of in the periphery around me. And what they wanted us to do 10 years ago was they wanted us to start 
I suppose, a, a wee Protestant version of the Irish language. And, you know, everything they said, we'd have said the opposite. And, you know, and about all and about the Emmons. And, you know, we were not interested in that. You know, we wanted to take our place within the Irish language community. And we've done that successfully. We've been befriended and helped. And, you know, we've made so many friends within the Irish language sector to so many groups and, you know, visits. And, oh, it's just, it's been amazing. It's absolutely amazing, the friendships and relationships we've made and the goodwill, absolute goodwill and how welcome. I mean, at the very beginning, again, when our learners were very frightened and nervous, you know, they, they were worried about going over to the falls. We used to physically take people over and introduce them and take them to culture land and take them to different places. We don't have to do that now. We just throw out the leaflets or send an email about, you know, things that are happening. And they go because they love the language and they want to get involved in the language. And also when they've went, they've been made so welcome. You know, when they tell people they're from Taurus, you know, this is wonderful. And, you know, they'll come back and say to me, oh, Linda, they were, see when we, we told them where we were from and they said, oh, it's, what you are doing is brilliant. So they take pride in that, you know. And, uh, and it's just, it's been, I, I can't tell you how healing and how lovely it's been. You know, it really, it really has. That's brilliant to hear, Linda. Uh, Stephen, were you looking to come in with another question there? Um, if it's okay to ask yes, the second right. question, is there anybody else who wants to go? <laughs> um, I've been uh, very quiet for a Monday night. Um, <laughs> I, I wondered if it would help the um, sort of loyalist community, which looks very strongly to Scotland, to maybe have something about the links between the Scottish Gaelic and the Irish language. There's I mean, you can go to churches in um, Lewis and places where they have all their service in Gaelic, which actually is fairly understandable, to be honest. Um, uh, you, you know, Anchirna is Anchirna in, in uh, Scottish stuff as well as here. So is it worth exploring some of that to try and break down some of these barriers that maybe you were saying there was a church that had no interest in what you were doing 10 years ago anyway maybe it would have a lot more interest now but is it worth getting some links with those communities over there well we're way ahead of you Stephen because we we did that a lot of years ago um because I've always been interested because again I didn't know that there was Gaelic spoken in Scotland or on the Isle of Man I didn't know that the language was part of the family of Celtic languages and obviously Celtic and Celtic language spoken in Wales and in Cornwall so those links throughout the British Isles are of great interest to me. And also, I, I think it, it sort of helps people within the unionist community to realise that, you know, you're not saying oh, this language separates us from that other island over there. It actually, you know, joins us. That's, that's how I see it. So, you know, we've been over in Scotland a number of times over the, the Gaelic speaking uh, regions. We went to Lewis, we went to the, the um, churches in Lewis. I spoke in one of the churches in Lewis. We had the Psalm Singers over here. We had a big event where we had about 200 people. We went to the Rangers Club in Lewis and I was presented with a um, a T-shirt that has Shannon Adini on it. And I use that in my talks and I always say they offered me choice of black or orange I don't know what it was something just drew me to the orange there you go and um, you know so yeah that that does because it shocks people it absolutely shocks people when they see these things that they regard as very Protestant and yet you've stamped Gaelic all over them and it makes them start to think and question so that has been really useful we went to the Isle of Man as well and we, we um, made good links there and met speakers and they come over here so it's very very important I think you know to do that to do that and not only to, to do it but to raise awareness of it we've done a lot of stuff on social media again raising awareness of, of those links um, to Scotland and to the Isle of Man and to the other parts um, one of my um, colleagues he created a wee um, sort of a glance card where it has all the different Celtic languages and showing you the links between them, you know, so how similar some of the words are, which is again very, very fascinating. We're actually going to be having a, a, a mother tongue. Um, I think it's coming up in a few weeks day, and he's going to come in and talk about Welsh and Scottish Gaelic and, and all those those different sort of 
um, local languages. Um, I, I personally am really fascinated by it. I, I studied um, Gaelic as part of my doing a degree in Irish at the minute at Queen's and I studied Gaelic last semester. And it was fascinating. It was fascinating how different it was and also how similar it was. Um, also, one, we, one of the times that we walked in St. Patrick's Day, we had on our banner um, a thing made of the, um, an image of the British Isles and all the different languages in their own local language on the banner. And, you know, I'm saying, you know, but it's our, our Jenga, our language, you know. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, any other uh, questions here? No, we're all very quiet. No, that's um, that's been wonderful, Linda, and so informative about the journey that you've undertaken and the passion that you have for the Irish language is very clear to see um, through all the work that you've done as well. So um, can I on behalf of Fermanagh and Oma District Council, uh, thank you for taking the time this evening to show us and all the work that you have achieved so far and also tell us uh, a bit more about um, the work that you're planning as well. So Gormila Mogus, um, anybody else want to come in with a last comment or anything? No? Um, okay. So for everybody's information, this video will be on the Fermana and Oma Gaelica Facebook page if you want to revisit or share the video with uh, friends who might not have been able to make it to see it live this evening. Just to let you know, a shock in Gaelica is coming up. I'm sure Linda is inundated with plans, the same as the rest of us. Um, and we are going to have a launch concert with Keela um, and they're performing for us on Sunday the 13th of February uh, in the Ardoan Theatre in Inniskillen. There'll also be a launch in the Oma area in the Street Arts Centre on the 16th and it'll be a smaller event but um, we're all very excited to get Keela up from Leitrim. Major the majority of them are coming from Leitrim, I think a few of them are coming from Dublin as well. Um, and then we will get started on all the events for Shock Nagilga as well. So Gurumila Magov got dinner and a special thank you very much to Linda for your time and effort coming this evening. Gurumila Magov, Slan. Hey, hey, hi, 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 h